Okay, so today is the twenty. Not today is the thirtieth of September. Sorry, and uh, two thousand seventeen, and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Rob Gutteridge. Okay, Rob. So perhaps I should start by uh, introducing myself. So yep. my name's Emilio Longo, and I'm a um. I've just graduated from my Master of Teaching, uh, Visual Arts Secondary, and um, prior to that, I went to art school. Basically, I studied a diploma of visual art starting in 2011 at RMIT TAFE and then I basically went into a Bachelor of Fine Art at the Victorian College of the Arts and went straight into the Master of uh, Teaching um, up just after that and I finished that basically in June this year. So yeah, it's been about six and a half consecutive years of art training but yeah, I'm glad to be at this point and I'm currently doing a bit of um, emergency teaching while I'm looking for a full-time uh, position as a visual arts teacher in secondary education. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's that's um, basically my background. Um, and, well, and, and for yourself, would you care to, I mean, I, I was looking at your CV, you've had an incredible CV. I mean, you, you, you studied art, you've done a Bachelor of Fine Art as well. Yeah. And um, Yeah, I could have... Sorry, sorry, Rob, can you repeat that? Um, yes, yeah, so I can I can talk to you about my background from that educational point of view, if you like. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, the CV just comes from um, being around for a long time. That's all. And I've, in as much as I can, I've tried all of my life to remain a, an artist um, yeah. and to support myself part time through teaching. So. Um, yeah, so that's that's where that that kind of general uh, length, I suppose, of activity comes from. Sure. So I was um, a student at the South Australian School of Art, and I entered there in 1972. Mm -hmm. I think I was 17 at the time. I went straight from art school, uh, straight from high school, and really all I wanted to do in high school was um, go to an art school. Sure. Uh, even though I'd been streamed academic area um they were very surprised to find out that i wanted to go into an arts like did consider it at the time to be a waste of time they yeah. told me that they said you're going to wait like <laughs> so anyway through that just i knew what i was up to and i just wanted, wanted to go to an art school so sure. i went to the one here in adelaide um yeah. and there was only one at the time um and it was a modernist school so mm -hmm. they the major thrust of things was abstraction mm -hmm. um very loose approach to teaching, you know, not very instructive. And, and I still have to say, while having met some wonderful people there in terms of lecturers, that I still ended up having to be self-taught in these kind of realist skills in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I studied there from 1972 to 75. Mm -hmm. So that was a full-time degree. Mm -hmm. It was a good degree, I think. But art education, in fact, art in general was so was thought of in such a lowly way that uh, they wouldn't give degree status to an art school based course yeah. they would only give it to universities yeah art school was just not uh, legit you know sure sure so anyway i i read a grad depart from uh, no sorry a diploma in fine art in painting from there after the 40, four years of full time study yeah and then i went from there into um I received a job in as a scientific illustrator at the South Australian Museum, mm -hmm. which was good as a connection between kind of art practice and things I was interested in, earning a bit of money. Sure, sure. And I painted at home. Um, and then uh, received a scholarship to the New York Studio School. Mm -hmm. That's from the Australia. Yeah. Uh, and at a time when nobody had heard much about the Studio School, so anyway, I was able to study there for um, a semester and receive some travel grants and things and had a look at collections and so on overseas in mm -hmm. Europe and America yeah. over a little bit. Um, yeah, and then have gone on to kind of further study as has been necessary in terms of my own teaching particularly. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I did a postgraduate teaching degree, um, I think in about 96, something like that. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I'd opened up a, an art school prior to that. Um, I've been able to study at an atelier, um, or an atelier school, I suppose you'd call it, um, mm. in France. Right. But that again, 
was very kind of modernist in its approach. Who was the teacher of that and, school? And that was a guy called Arthur Longley, a really mm. old guy at the time, um, but he had interesting history mm. in that he had, his his friends when he was younger were so he was in his eighties when he when I was loosely taught by him. Sure. Um, but he he had friends who were Picasso and uh, Braque. Wow. Uh, he knew all of the early modernists and wow. the Surrealists and so on. Um, Karl Weiler had asked him to um, to become his dealer, which he didn't want to have anything to do with. So mm-hmm. he tucked himself away in France and built this atelier at school. Sure. So that that was interesting from that point of view. So I went back to Australia. Um, thought I could. I could run an art school. I'm sure I could. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I started one, and I ran it together with my wife, who who taught young people. Mm. Um, and we ran that for about four years. Okay. It's two kind of intermediate, and my my own skills still needed to be kind of developed. I had I didn't know anatomy at that time. I'd never been taught it. Um, sure. And so I went back to uni to learn about teaching as as a, an educational kind of theory um, yeah. and um and did that then did some other postgrad work in fine art mm-hmm. mainly because where when i was where i was found myself teaching which was at the adelaide central school of art um i because i've been working for so long my um my own theoretical base came from like the 70s mm. and then i was teaching young people who were working in like mid 2000s sure. and a lot changed along the way you know so i really felt that i needed to kind of find out what they were being taught um so i i went back to uh do a grad dip in fine art for mainly for those sorts of reasons um yeah. particularly the sort of art theory sort of side of things of course yeah um, yeah and then i did some well, i worked at a tafe college for a long time mm-hmm. and uh, there's a there's a qualification requirement for that, so I had to go back to uni again and uh, get um, a um, cert four in workplace and assessment training, yeah. which is a necessary thing, yeah, for tape. Sure. Um, and then in about two thousand, yeah, probably about two thousand, I think, mm-hmm. um, I began teaching anatomy, and that was a long three year project, um, just purely self instigated, uh, teaching myself. Um, but I came out of it knowing that, um, and that's sort of my educational background, I suppose. Um, yeah. And then just, you know, I've always looked on my art practice as being, um, I'm not very good at uh, making objects that are for exhibition. I've always looked on, on making art as being a form of research, you know. Sure. It's a way of finding out about the world. It's not just me expressing my ideas or mm-hmm. uh, any lot or having a reputation, I really don't care about that stuff. I've always looked on art making as being a, a form of research. So yeah. you know, it doesn't fit well with galleries, um, mm-hmm. and so, but it doesn't especially matter to me. It's just bad luck. Um, mm-hmm. But I'd still look at that way, you know, that it's that it's a, a way of researching things. And constantly, as a result, you feel like you're learning all the time. Because like, there's always something new to find out about, you know. So, yeah. so that's yeah. kind of comfortable, yeah. Great. So, do you refer to yourself as an artist, Rob? Yeah, yeah, I do. do? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Most primarily, I'm an artist. Yeah. Primarily, yeah. So, I'll pour myself a, a, like sort of a lifelong art student. I'm sort of similar to mm. you. I, I'm not too big on the whole uh, professional side of you know exhibiting and uh, basically my art studies are research into mainly pre 20th century uh, drawing, painting, and sculpture techniques. Mm. Um, but when you were in, when you were doing a BFA, what so the basically, basically the doctrine of that university was based on a modernist kind of approach. Um, so were you doing figurative work at that time? I was doing two things. Um, I did life drawing mm. um, the time that I was there. Whenever I could get to, into a class, I would do life drawing and life painting occasionally. Although, yeah. as I said, they weren't taught structured courses. Yeah. But the other work that I was doing, I, I was actually very interested in abstraction at the time, mm-hmm. um, and for all sorts of reasons. And I, I, I went into that area quite deeply. So I was doing both things simultaneously. Yeah. And the scholarship 
that I received to go to New York was on the basis of the abstract paintings. But when I got there, I would do abstract paintings during the day. Yeah. And then at night, I would go to life class and I would spend all night life drawing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always been these two things together for me. Yeah. Sure. Because I, I was looking at yeah. your... I was looking at your uh, earlier work, um, and then I was yeah. looking at the work that you've got on the Rob Gutteridge uh, School of Classical Realism's website, and I do notice a bit of a difference there, where there was, it yeah. was a heavily uh, inspired abstractionist work in the start, whereas now I see more like, um, you know, a lot more figurative work, a lot more uh, emphasis on the figure and, and, and solid draw drawing skills. Yeah. So there's yeah. been a yeah, there's yeah. been a bit That's of a shift. Sort of a huge shift really yeah. in fact it was one of the really interesting reasons for me to keep painting was mm. that i knew that this shift was going on mm -hmm. and i actually wanted to change it incrementally and so i did a whole group of paintings which are abstract or non-objective mm -hmm. um i did some that were semi-figurative and i knew that it was heading in towards realism and i actually wanted to plot that out i was really interested in this transformation nobody yeah. else was interested but i was um and um, and for me, the interest in abstraction came from a lot of things. Um, I think primarily, I think it, there is a place for abstraction. Um, and for me, at least, it had a, a kind of an existential motivation to it mm. um, in that mm. it was something that it was a vehicle that I could use to talk about not quite knowing my place in the world. Yeah, and I could make images that were non-recognizable. In, in other words, I wanted to put the viewer into a similar s situation of discomfort sure. that I felt myself in at the time. Yeah, uh, and I'm a migrant, so I came from England. I think yeah. that displacement aspect, feeling connected to where you are, has stayed with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that abstraction as a way of presenting images that were having to be questioned all the time without yeah. being able to get security of recognition was um, was the reason that I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, th I ran that as far as I possibly could until I just ran out of ideas. I sure. just rung it. And that was about the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. And it was also problematic at that time because I had met people in New York, a, a dealer in particular who's an Australian woman, um, who was interested in showing my work, but they... I knew what was going on. For me to be able to continue exhibiting or, or doing that kind of work, I would have had to have turned that um, that existential situation into a kind of craft. Mm -hmm. You know, in a, I would have had to commercialize my uh, the state, the motivation for doing it, and turning it, turned it into a, a design activity or a crafting activity. Where, well, yeah, I could do another twenty abstract paintings, and I could redesign them and deal with other, you know, color configurations or whatever. Yeah. But that it was never about a craft for me. And the the abstract artists that I really liked, particularly people like de Kooning, um, who was a big motivator for me, mm -hmm. um, they can look on their work as a, a design object. Mm -hmm. They were having to do this kind of work mm -hmm. because of some deep inner need. Yeah. Um, and realism didn't suit that. Yeah. But anyway, so the thought of it is that by the time I'd realized that I'd come to an end for that, that I couldn't do it anymore, I knew that the only way to continue going was to nourish myself by looking at the visual world again, just what was around me. It was so obvious, but it sure. took ages for me for the drop. Um, and the more I began looking at the world, the more interested I became in it. I'd always, I'd, because of my uh, involvement as a scientific illustrator, mm -hmm. I'd always been able to look at things in you know considerable detail. I was really interested, actually, in the natural world. Yeah. And that's where the human figure is. You know, I still see it as an aspect of the natural world, a bit like scientific illustration to some extent, but with some emotion. Sure. But... Um, yeah, but that sort of movement into realism was a very natural fit for me. You know, I'd actually, the abstraction had served its purpose. Yeah. And I, I wasn't in the same place any longer. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, becoming a different person and I needed a different vehicle to be able to talk about how I'd changed. Sure. And and it was something that really answered all of that stuff for me. So, yeah. Okay, great. And it's, so um, at that time, were you aware of this kind of uh, revival in um, realism that was occurring pretty much internationally in Europe and uh, in the United States? No, I wasn't, no. You no. weren't, yeah. So even, 
Yeah, even when I went, even when I went to the um, New York Studio School, it mm. was still a. Uh, they, it was a very mixed school. They did have a realist aspect to it, and their director is a realist artist, but it's very modernist in its approach. Sure, sure. Um, no, no sense of the refinement or the craft and of, of art objects. Who was um, the director? But no, Sorry, Rob, who was uh, the director of Grant, that school? Yeah, Graham Nixon. Oh, well, Graham a lot of the Nixon. time that I was there, yeah, Graham Nixon, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Sure. Um, so at what point did you come to uh, find, I suppose, this kind of new movement of uh, realism or, or, or re, re, you know, re, restructured realism that has occurred since, I suppose, the 1970s? Um, when yeah. did you come across it? How did you find it? Well, it's really been over about the last three years that I've become very aware of it. Yeah. Um, I knew it to some extent prior to that. Mm. but. My, my awareness came really from, um, I was teaching lots of students who had nowhere to go to learn traditional skills. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'd teach workshops in, say, anatomy or whatever, and it was always the same question. At the end of the workshop, well, what, what comes next? Where do we go next? Yeah. I'd come to contact with lots of young students who enter art schools thinking they're going to learn how to paint and draw mm. in a realist fashion. Yeah. and find that in no way is that going to happen at any of the art schools currently here. Sure. And I just felt, I wouldn't say kind of a moral obligation, but I did feel an obligation to some extent that I had all of these skills. Mm -hmm. I was meeting people at the time who needed help. Yeah. And you know yourself, for a teacher, mm. you're, that's, that's part of your character. You, you mm -hmm. have a, <laughs> there's some desire to help people. That's right. Yeah, and so I thought, well, I know the workshops don't work. I knew of atelier training mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. I, I had my own ideas about how I thought that things should be organised. Mm -hmm. So I began writing up possible scenarios for curricula and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then began research and then was just amazed to find all of this stuff going on overseas with exactly the same motivation that I had. So, mm -hmm. So my... Knowledge of it came about in a way quite innocently. Mm -hmm. you know, it was after the decision rather than looking around saying, let's go on there, I'll do some of that. I was just meeting people who, who wanted help you know, constantly. And they, I really felt sorry for them, actually. You know, they didn't have anywhere to go, and I thought, this isn't right. In fact, the only – sorry to interrupt. The, the only – yeah, the, the other aspect that really bugged me was that I thought the only way that these people, young people or, or and old people, the only way they could get this kind of education was going to be very expensive. Get on a plane, go and live in Europe or America for X amount of time. And I was thinking, well, who's going to do that? Basically, a few rich people. That'll be it. All the people who want help will be stuck in the situation of not knowing just because they don't have enough money. That's and I right. Thought, That's a real like a social injustice for me, you know, that education shouldn't be based on how much money you have. I agree mm. completely with that, Rob. And it's such a common, um, like, you know, complaint that you hear these art students that do a BFA or an MFA going into it expecting to receive, you know, sk skill-based training in, in drawing and, and painting and just, you know, getting there and, and becoming disheartened because it's just all, you know, conceptual art and uh, postmodernist philosophy um, yep. you know, post-medium practice, these kind of terms yep. that, um, yeah, it can be very frustrating. I know, and I, I went through it as well. Um, but mm. yeah, but um, yeah, just a <laughs> yeah, and I'm I uh, basically, I mean, I'm not one to talk speak badly of the, my experience in in a, in a you know conceptual art school because I think it's the main thing that comes from that kind of education is the capacity to think critically about uh, mm. about things. Um, and you know, there's so much emphasis in that in, the, in those environments on the critique, the group critique. You know, where you put your work up and you talk about your work from an objective point of view, then a subjective point of view. Um, and it just really helped me to understand more about what contemporary art is today. You know, so um, yeah, I don't I don't necessarily speak badly of it. I think it's a, it's a great thing, and it helped me to become a, a teacher. Obviously, I can talk to students about you know conceptualism and modernity and, and, and art ideas relate, related to these sort of um, subjects but yeah but it is very frustrating um, for a lot of people because there is no technical instruction at all in, in, in regards to drawing 
and painting. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the teachers, the lecturers there themselves haven't received that training and that's why it's so, it's so hard. Yeah. Um, and I see, uh, and one thing I suppose now that's happened is we've had, we have, so I want, I want to back up just for a moment. Now you, you've mentioned a word several times so far, atelier. Mm -hmm. Now this is a word that we're, it's, it's kind of a, um, a, a resurrected word, I suppose, from the 19th century that we're using and it means studio or workshop in French. Okay, and yes. this this is the word that we're now using to, um, d I guess, distinguish a, a specific type of uh, artistic training, as opposed yeah. to the the bachelor, you know, fine art sort of university model of art training. Um, so it's it's come to it's basically means studio or workshop, which is which is the environment that the the student would be trained in under usually one master artist and a usually a small group of of students. But it's also become affiliated with a, um, a a particular process of training, which is like which we have the term now the atelier trained artist, which, which is referring to you know the, the progression from drawing from drawing models, drawing from plastic casts, and then finally drawing from the human figure, um, mm -hmm. and I think yeah it's an it's an alternative basically education now that's kind of developed under the cultural surface since since mm -hmm. the nineteen seventies, um, and. And I think from and the reason I say the 1970s is because this is when um, the the father of the the contemporary atelier movement is 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 considered by many to be Richard Lack. Um, he had Atelier yeah. Lack in Minneapolis in uh, in the 70s. He opened that up. He's he is of course a student of R. H. I. S. Gamel, who was a student of William McGregor Paxton, who was a student of uh, Jerome, I believe. And then we have Jerome, who was a student of, of Ang, and then Ang was a student of Jack Louis David. And this is the kind of lineage that this um, form of academic art has survived through. So we have people now who studied with Richard Lack in the 1970s who have gone off and opened up their own ateliers, uh, studio schools that are patterned after the 19th century French, um, French model, uh, the, the working methods of the, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in Paris, and and and, um, and the private ateliers that a lot of the artists uh, had outside of the, the the school as well, um, and I suppose to kind of what I'm getting at at this. So today I see that there there are two two types of art students uh, that that are inspired by pre twentieth century art. The first are the ones who um, who who look at uh, pre twentieth century drawing and, and painting and sculpture and who um, are observing it through a lens of contemporary criticism. So they, um, they are looking at this work and they are creating a kind of uh, response to this work that becomes this postmodernist kind of, um, you know, uh, t a twist on, on a, on a pre-20th century subject matter. And here I'm thinking of artists like, they're familiar with John Curran? Uh, yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, so this idea of kind of appropriation, which becomes mm. this kind of postmodern uh, thing, and then there's a, the second type of artist is the the, the art student who looks at the early uh, you know academic work, and who may be in an art school, contemporary art school, and says, you know, I don't want to, you know, have this kind of uh, postmodern approach on this kind of work. I just look at this work, and I don't care. I just want to learn how to do what these artists were doing, the technical training. And be able to to basically draw that that well that you know incredibly well, um, yeah. So that's the kind of division that I kind of see now. There's these there's these two different um, schools of, of of thought. Perhaps you've got the contemporary art students coming out of the university art schools, and then you've got these other art students who are att attending these atelier schools um, and getting this kind of uh, you know op opposite kind of training, which is all about skill and technique. And not really about ideas, whereas the uh, the university training is all about you know idea development and getting your work out there, having exhibitions when you're in your second year of your degree, and um, yeah, it's really it's it's like polar opposites almost what's going on, um, and yeah, and it's it's well, I'm completely with you on that what you're saying about the the training today isn't accessible, it's because you know first of all we don't have the schools that they have in the amount of schools they have in America and Europe. Um, congratulations, by the way, on being the first um, 
founder and and and, and director of a, a ARC that's an art renewal center accredited um, atelier school. Um, that's fantastic. That's a that's Thank a huge you. achievement, and um, I really followed the have followed the development of your school from 2016 with enthusiasm. So well done on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's ridiculous that a student should have to relocate to Europe to get this kind of training, and it is expensive. I mean, the, the amount of money these schools charge uh, per, you know, they, they, I think in Europe it's trimesters. So per trimester, it's really a lot of money, and um, it's just not accessible to a student that wants to learn to draw. But uh, I mean, even in Australia, if we 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 look at what's available to us to an, in Australia, we have Australia's oldest art school, which is which is the Julian Ashton um, Art School, which um, I, I know hasn't got ARC is not an ARC accredited school. I'm not sure why. We also have um, atelier art classes in Salisbury in Brisbane, I think it is, and that's headed by Scott Breton and some other people who train at the Florence Academy of Art, I, I think. Um, and I know in Melbourne we've got the Victorian Artist Society and um, we have the 20 Melbourne Painters Society and their lineage kind of goes back to the Heidelberg School and um, Max Meldrum, or the School of uh, Tonal Realism uh, and things like that. But from what I can see from their kind of um, approach to, to painting, they're more based on a, uh, a tonalist approach where they basically draw, everything is done with the brush, they draw with the, the brush straight into painting um, and there isn't really that emphasis on solid academic drawing, uh, drawing skills. So yeah, so basically what I'm trying to get at is we don't have the kind of uh, opportunities that Europe and America has here in Australia. And why do you think that's the case? Uh, it's it's got to be geographic distance, I think, as much as anything. Um, from my reading of things. Um, I think America was in a similar situation, um, and I, you might know the story, but I believe I'll just paraphrase it as best I can. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, heavy involvement of French in the colonization of the U.S., mm -hmm. so the French had a presence, mm -hmm. and um, in for whatever reason, I think um, it might have been uh, Napoleon's brother yeah uh you have visited i think pennsylvania um so early 1800s i guess late late 1700s mm -hmm. um and they decided to make a donation of european plaster casts to i think the pennsylvania academy of arts that's right and yeah okay and so they they had this kind of connection with french culture French approaches to um, art making mm -hmm. um, skill and all the rest of it. And so they were able to begin a connection, which I think sustained them. There was, there was a connection there with what was going on in France. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the French actually had a, an active kind of interest in, in promoting what was going on in their own art schools within that area. And that was, that was part of the gift to them in a way. Now, mm -hmm. I think that there's been a legacy of that that, that is within the U.S. Yeah. And as well in, uh, I think, oh, around 1900, I think there were 2,000 U.S. artists who were studying in Paris. Yeah. You know, like yeah. a huge amount, you know, so that mm -hmm. connection had had, had remained. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of places in uh, southern U.S. which have this strong French connection, French names, French, um, French accents, yeah. uh, French all sorts of things. So it's mm. so it's there, and um, then because people wanting to learn, U.S. artists wanting to learn realism, and all the rest of it, and I think they were in a similar situation. There wasn't much in America, so they went to Europe and mainly went to France, mm. I, I think. Mm. So, and th th there was never that lucky connection in Australia yeah. for to happen, you know. And mm -hmm. so I think. Isolation geographically has, has had a, a huge part to play in it, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's where it's coming from. Sure, and that makes sense. I agree. Um, I think prior to um the actual uh cast being given to uh the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and and to, uh, the sculptor Antonio Canova, basically um he donated a few plaster casts to the Boston Antenaeum, which was like a. Hey. 
it's like a cultural center in America, and that was pretty much where European art, you know, the, uh, the, the American artists were inspired by European art. The basic, the basically the the plaster casts that were in in the Boston Antheneum, and then and then eventuated into the um, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, which t still today has an incredible pl plaster cast collection and um, a good solid program, art art training program, um, and. Um, and yeah, but of course, uh, as 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 you were saying, so many artists from America went to uh, to to France to the Ecole de Beaux Arts to to train to get solid uh, uh, draw, uh, drawing and painting and, and sculpture skills, and then they came back to their hometown and opened up their own schools, their ateliers, and they passed on their knowledge to the next generation of of American artists. So yeah. 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 I wonder as well. Um, you, it's very interesting to hear you talk. You, you know more about these things than I do, but uh, <laughs> I think also there is. Um, I don't. There's no evidence for it, but I do wonder if there are cultural attitudes, social attitudes mm -hmm. that are different in Australia compared to the US. Yeah. And I, th I think within Australia there is a, um, one wouldn't necessarily say a disrespectful approach mm -hmm. to authority. But it's certainly questioned, and mm -hmm. it's part of the larrikin kind of attitude mm -hmm. of um, how one deals with authority. That mm -hmm. uh, it's always questioned. Yeah. Um, and I think that I still find it with my my own sort of new students, you know. And I, and when I'm saying, look, this drawing is going to take you 50 hours or 60 hours, whatever it's going to be, mm -hmm. and it's everything. There's no second best. This mm -hmm. has got to be it. Was there's no point in being here. Um, you know, everything is taken to the max, mm -hmm. and it's just. Used to, what about near enough is good enough? Is yeah. the kind of you that I get. Yeah. Why do we have? Why do you? Why do you have to do it in such a, an intense way? What? And you know, it's it's all part of that thing of well, I think as well because Australia's in a bit of a geographic bubble, mm -hmm. it tends to be a closed community. Yeah. And, and I think there are problems there. It can become very self-congratulatory, you know. Yeah. Australia's a great place to live, mm -hmm. pretty safe, climate, food. Most people get along okay mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. um, so why rock the boat by saying, well, you have to work even harder, you know, yeah. to get things this kind of standard, you know. Sure. Everything's good. Yeah. And you have mates who say, yeah, you're great, you're a genius. And, yeah. You know. That you've got galleries and institutions here who are looking at their own kind of small pond and say, well, we'll support whatever's here. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when you're in touch with what's going on overseas and historically as well, and you appreciate how much people are striving, you know, to become really good mm. uh, and they enjoy the challenge. Mm. Um, and here I think there is that kind of attitude that, well, it's pretty good, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> like family, but, you know, it's yeah. not about that. It's about standards, you know. That's right. And, and you, get, you get that when you're involved in or trying to connect with things that are just the best that you can imagine yeah. in the field of work you're in, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, Australia's a bit kind of closed as a, as a community. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree about that. Like it's, um, you know, even in – um with my experiences in teaching uh, like observational drawing in, in secondary schools, I mean, you know, when you ask a student, when you do an observational drawing, it's about developing the eye, developing accuracy in drawing, and you ask your student to correct the drawing for, you know, a second or third time, I mean, you, you know, listen to their response, basically they, they, they'll tell you off because they're just sick and tired of correcting and correcting and correcting. They don't, and I think what it is, is they don't understand what the end result is. Like if we look for instance, at the um, the drawing models. Okay, so the drawing models are the first um, basic exercise that the academically trained artist uh, undergoes. And today we're using the drawing models that were created by Charles Barg in collaboration with Jean Leon Jerome. Um, the, the the basically the core de design as they were known in, in French, the drawing course, and and those actual plates uh, referred to as drawing models, from what I understand. And um, they're the, the first step, so it's about two-dimensional shape copying. So you're learning to, you're learning the basic principles of academic draftsmanship, the refined contours, the simplified shadow shapes, 
and you're learning how to represent that on, on a, a two-dimensional surface. And that basically uh, prepares you to then move into the next phase of academic training, which is drawing from, from the round, and that's the, the plaster casts. Um, and, that, and in that case, you're learning to, to still apply what you've learned from the, from the bar drawings, from the, the, the classical, um, you know, the ca classical antiquity, and basically copy shapes from the round. Um, you know, your, uh, you basically get your contour drawing established accurately before you start mapping out your, your shadow shapes and before you, of course, get, in, get into uh, value or, or, or modeling. Um, and then basically that's carried forward into uh, life paint, painting or, or figure, figure drawing and figure painting. Um, and that is, that's actually the, the final step of the, the, the artist training, whereas I see it in the contemporary art schools, university art schools, life drawing is almost done, you know, it's pretty much done as the first thing, and the other two have become obsolete, like drawing models and cast drawing has become obsolete. People don't see value in drawing from plaster cast. They don't see value in why would you suffer copying you know a bar drawing to the point where it's indistinguishable from the you know from the reference you're looking at i mean why would you do that and i think it's just because people don't understand what we're trying to do they don't see the end product i mean you go through all those stages you know you get good at drawing from the flat you get good at drawing from the round you get good at drawing from the live in in the end you can draw you know to such a a way that embodies the standard of you know the western european academic approach to draftsmanship um, and that, yeah, I guess it, that people just don't see the end. They don't see what the, what the point is um, uh, for, for all of that. And um, what, one thing I wanted to ask you, so in your, I was looking at your curriculum on the Rob Gutteridge School of uh, Classical Realism and how did you uh, go about, what, what did you base your curriculum off? Was it based on the schools that you saw abroad? Was it on your own research through books? Uh, can you speak a bit about that? Yeah, um, it was um, a general knowledge about how drawing and painting had been taught historically. Yeah. And so particularly looking at it, even from the uh, Renaissance period, where students, even though they didn't have the bugs, they still began walking, uh, drawing from the flat. Mm. So the master's drawings or prints, whatever it was they had available. And mm. I thought, well, this is a really interesting idea. So, you know, that always struck me as being a sensible way to begin. It seems retro retrograde, but it's actually not. Yeah. That for me, the cast drawing is so um, absolutely obvious in mm. its benefits. Mm. I do not understand why art schools who are dealing with the human figure have not got them. You know, it's there are so many absolutely just logical things about working from a cast that that you, you don't have to go far. It's not even thinking, well, I, sh I need to link up with how ateliers are doing it overseas or whatever. Mm -hmm. You just run through the reasons for it and it makes absolute sense. Yeah. You no know, colour, folk tone, mm -hmm. things that are generalised, mm -hmm. helping people to understand they need to work from the general to the specific. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that moves, they can spend as long as they want in it. You can adjust the light and so on and so on. It's it's so, it's so valuable. Yeah. Uh, and then looking at uh, how how I've understood education as being developing skills from the simple to the complex, that you, that simplicity needs to be set in place, and order needs to be developed so that the eventual complex objects can be done by a person in an orderly way where they feel confident and competent, because everything is set up in a very logical manner, and it, and consequently everything is success driven. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get good at this section, then that's the basis for getting good at the next, more difficult section, and so on it goes. It really is empowering for people. People feel great about it, mm -hmm. uh, a sense of accomplishment, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, so it was a, a vague general idea as to how one would logically set up a really good art school, mm -hmm. which, which to me was, um, uh, but it was almost self-evident, mm -hmm. you know, that's how you, this is how it would be done. Then I began having a look at schools overseas when I was starting to think about a curriculum for my school yeah. and having a look at how they're doing it. And that general model is in place with different sort of inflections depending on, you know, if he's teaching it and, and so on. But essentially that model is there. And That's so right. there is flexi there's flexibility within it um, for your own personal kind of interest to mm. develop um, 
and uh, I had a look at some of the other things and also uh, what didn't necessarily need to kind of choose any particular curriculum to copy or emulate, although there are components of them that I have included in my curriculum. But it was more to do with, um, again, setting in place a curriculum that would be logical in its approach for mm -hmm. students to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really formed the, the basis of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was also really useful to look at other curricula and when I was overseas earlier um, this year to go and speak to people who are running ateliers. Mm -hmm. It's a little like what you're saying. When there are no models within the place that you're working, whether they're actually paintings and drawings that people can emulate or you can point out and say, this is a standard, you could do this, mm -hmm. that are really good. Also, if there are no teaching models where one can look around and say, look, this school is doing it. What I'm asking you to do is reasonable. Mm -hmm actually found that was very valuable to find out exactly what other art schools were doing mm -hmm. because I need to be able to justify, you know, when I'm saying to my students, okay, this story is going to take you 80 hours. Sure. So that's ridiculous. Why do I have to do that and all the rest? And I say, mm -hmm. look, it's going on in this place and this place and this place. There are people all over the world who, for, you, for them, it is normal, mm -hmm. absolutely normal. It only seems strange to you because there's no model for it. You, mm -hmm. You've never seen it before experienced it before yeah so i actually found that that was very important you know to 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 kind of benchmark my expectations against what was going on overseas and when i find that i'm pitching it in, at the same place that they are mm -hmm. then i feel secure i feel as if i'm on the right track because likewise it's a bit like when i was teaching myself anatomy i'm doing this all you know a vacuum essentially you know yeah. i'm getting it right but i do need um, to be in touch with these other places to check, you know, to find out is what I'm doing as good as is as good as can be done overseas. Yeah. I'm not expecting much, not expecting too little, but what I'm doing is reasonable mm -hmm. for the outcomes to be able to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of thing. Yeah. So the students in your school now, I mean, do they understand what this training is? Yeah, they do. They yeah. do. Yeah, they do. So we talk about it quite a lot. So it's not only just them coming into class and doing whatever it is they're doing, but we do talk a lot about the whole context of it. Mm -hmm. and in fact, it becomes part of the way that I have to rationalize what I'm asking them to do. Sure. Um, able to put it into a context um, to say that, look, I know it seems extreme mm -hmm. and the critique is, is very um, uncompromising. Yeah. But for your benefit in the end mm -hmm. and I also have the flow chart of my curriculum and all the subjects up in place mm -hmm. so they see it we talk about it from time to time that you do this before this before this and this is the reasons for it so that contextualizing their own education it, it helps to reassure them you know they know okay well it might get me take me a year to get through the bug drawings mm -hmm. part-time but that's okay I know that I'll, there's a next step sure. know, and the next step is reason for it so yeah it's important actually to let them know the context within which they're they're doing their own little intense bit of study yeah sure so um you mentioned that what you were in i think you were in london right earlier this year is, is that right yeah yeah and so you, you i want to know just generally who in, in regards to directors of the schools and, and people affiliated with this you know atelier movement as it's come to be called um, who have you had contact with? Who have you who have you met? Okay, so the people that I met in London, I mainly went to see people at uh, at Lara at the yeah. London Academy of yeah. Real Estate. Um, the director there, who who spoke to me, um, took me around, and all the rest was James Napier, mm -hmm. and he had been a student at the Florence Academy of Art. Yeah. So that's his lineage. Mm. Really nice guy. Yeah. Just doing it exactly as it should be done, you know, right. uncompromising, nice atmosphere, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, I also went um, to the um, Florence Academy of Arts campus in Sweden. Wow. So in Gothenburg, I went there and met Michael DeVore, who was the um, studio manager there. Mm -hmm. He did the same, he threw it through the plays. We talked about all of these things and it was really good. You know, I could ask them very specific questions about, well, how long did this drawing take? How, how are your students feeling about this? How many full-timers have you got? Have a look at what their space is like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so 
very practical things. Um, so that was that was really good. And prior to that, um, I went and was very fortunate to be given guided tours of the um, Russian State Academy, the Ilya Repin State wow. Academy. In, yeah, it's amazing. Incredible. And yeah, and also the Stiglitz Academy of Applied Art in Saint Petersburg. Yeah. And my wife. My wife is Russian. Um, okay. Rather, she's Australian, but her parents are Russian. Yeah. But we, she has friends there who are artistically connected and academically connected as well. And and I wrote to them a number of times to say I'd like to look through your academy. We've got nothing back, nothing oh, at all. Oh wow! Yeah. We have a a family member who um, has academic connections, mm -hmm. and he was able to be in touch eventually with um, a professor of painting at. Uh, at the Russian Academy of Art, who very graciously took me through the place, and that was just fantastic. Incredible. So this building that's in is 250 years old. Uh -huh. um, they've been teaching the same thing for 250 years, which is classical academic approach to life drawing, life painting, and architecture. They teach there as well. That's right. It was just brilliant. So. Uh, and we went back to a studio afterwards, and it was just a wonderful time. But to actually be able to go there and see it. Incredible. One of the other things that I found while I was there um, was that not only is the anatomy room just amazing that they've got set up, and we went and sat there, and there was a class on very quiet. You know, every, everything there was very quiet, amazing. Yeah. Um, and he was saying, look, these are the seats that Ilya Repin sat in when he was <laughs> studying, the, that he would have sat. It was just you know, so you get these bumps. As well. And imagine, um, yeah. But also, we when we were walking through these long corridors that connect all of the studios and so on, um, from time to time there'd be a student would be coming up the corridor, and they would stop um, and and stop and and uh, address this professor in his patronymic term, or be sir to us, or Mister so and so. Sure. Um, shook his shook his hand. Big smiles and bowed. Wow! You know, yeah. So, in terms of this kind of respect thing, when you were talking about your kids and and like, you know, do, do I have to draw this much or do I have yeah. to correct it again? <laughs> yeah. Or looked on their teachers in such uh, with such a high degree of respect that they shook their hands and bowed to them. They felt really privileged to be taught by these people. You know, Incredible. so that's the kind of cultural attitude thing that. Art schools in Australia, boy, forget it. You That's know, right. You'll be lucky, lucky if you're taken seriously as a lecturer. But you know, you'll always get kicked back. Yeah. Why do I have to do that? Yeah. Being questioned all the time. Sure. So that was, that was a buzz, and and the Stiglitz Academy, likewise, was equally spectacular. You know, spectacular building, spectacular environments. Mm -hmm. Very quiet in the working environments. You know, yeah. and and also. They become kind of symbols of how important this academic training is. Mm -hmm. Like edifice, you know, these architectural wonders are mm. designed purely mm. so that this can happen. So you go in and you know this is serious stuff. This is really serious. Yeah. It's really a, a full immersion to the tradition, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the St Russian State Academy, they have um, their basic. Their basic course is five years full time. Yeah. They re students do a sixth year. They want them to do a sixth year full time. Mm -hmm. They would then go outside there and be practicing, not exhibiting, mm -hmm. but learning to become artists for the next ten years. That's right. And then they might start. A, you know, it's that kind of approach. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, the um, the actual tr artistic training in in Russia is incredible. I mean, school uh, students that you know ha intend to become fine artists really start their artistic training whilst they're doing their secondary education. So after Ooh. after school they basically go to an art school and they learn, you know, they learn drawing, they learn painting, they, they basically learn craftsmanship and the principles of classicism. Um, and there's a yeah. respect there, there's a respect I think in, in, in Russia and I think it's because of the Iron Curtain, um, you Ooh. know, they were basically closed off for a long time and they're, they're, there's this, yeah, That's there's right. this real res respect and tolerance for um, cl classicism there that you know we didn't we don't really have or we don't we didn't really have in other parts of the world because the the Repin Academy is um, the lot that you know it's a continuing academy it's basically the the Ecole de Beaux Arts of of, of Russia yeah. and it's it's continuing right. it's continuing till today basically 
which is fantastic. And um, and I think for some time there has been a little bit of uh, a kind of mystery that surrounded the academy because I think for a while there they weren't letting American artists into the academy. It was only Russian citizens. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's really interesting and it's an area that I want to um, discuss more with people who have actually studied in the the Repin Academy as well. Um, but so so you went to you went to Russia. You had a look in the Repin Academy. Uh, anywhere else? No, they were the four places that went to. Um, so the two institutions in Russia, the one in Gothenburg in Sweden, mm-hmm. and the one in London. Mm-hmm. Um, but while I was in London, I did do some other things that were related to this. So I went to the Victoria and Albert Museum, mm-hmm. um, and organized beforehand uh, an opportunity to see bark drawings, um, like the actual lithographs. The actual ones, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that was really good. And they, I was only able to see a few, um, but I'll go back again and because I believe it's one of the few places that's still got a full collection of the bark plates. Yeah. The lithographs, I think so. The so I'll go back there again. Nevertheless, it was fantastic to be able to hold these things. Wow. And also they're in a collection drawings from uh, French drawings from about the period of Boucher, you know, just pre-revolutionary. Yeah. So there's Bush, Fragonard, people like that. And mm-hmm. actually being able to hold these things, you know, yeah. just one after another after another, it was just fantastic. Incredible. So anyway, I yeah, went to a lot of uh, galleries, that uh, museums that were to do with, that held classical collections, mm-hmm. so the Ashley in Oxford, um, all the galleries in London, mm-hmm. and also the Society of Graphic Fine Art, I became a, I was accepted into yeah, being a member of that. That's right. Met yeah. with them. And that too was really nice. I mean, that's an institution that's been around for 95 years. Wow. Continuous process of drawing is a, an important activity. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, they're, they're, and they're vibrant, you know, they're still holding exhibitions, got lots of membership, and so it's, that was great. Yeah. So, yeah, amazing. apart from all of the art museums that I could, especially those in Russia, mm-hmm. I mean, and the Russian uh, Museum of Art, the, those sorts of things, which are real eye-openers. Um, yeah. yeah, it was day after day for about five weeks of, of constant um, art-related activity or appointments to meet with people and so on. Very, very good. Incredible. And I want to do it again. Yeah. And part of it is encourage my students to do it. Yes. Go overseas if you can. Go and do a summer school somewhere at one of these places, you know, and just mm-hmm. find out where you fit in the international context yeah. because of this resurgence that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, they are part of it yeah. and they need to actually see it, see that they're part of it. Mm. That's right. Yeah, it's so important for us to um, have a dialogue with, with you know, we're, we're very few and far between, I think, the people that yeah. have a, a respect for this form of art yeah. and it's important that we kind yeah. of share and develop a community like they do in Europe and America. Um, you know, so we can help to carry the work forward and, you know, does that, I've heard it said, this analogy by so many people involved in this atelier movement that a a, a rising tide lifts all boats, this idea of Mm. knowledge, I mean, if we can get good together, we're just going to help, you know, lift the the quality of work back to to what it was in the 19th century, because I think what we're dealing with now um, I like to think of, of, a, of a, if I give you an analogy, of a, like a jigsaw puzzle. And then if the jigsaw puzzle was the kind of body of knowledge that was 19th century and pre-19th century studio practices, which was eventually uh, broken down f- through the advent of modernity and post-modernity. And what we have now, this new uh, resurgence, is we have a very fragmented uh, body of knowledge. So, for instance, perhaps what you're doing, Rob, is like one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. What Italy is doing is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. What New York is doing is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And if we can find ways to connect pieces of those jigsaw puzzle together, we're going to come to a more comprehensive body of knowledge and ultimately to a, a better understanding of of uh, of the actual way that these these 19th century and prior artists created their their incredible works. Um, and and going off of that, um, I understand so you use a, you use the bar drawings in your in your uh, in your school, and I know that's the the, the, the they're the most popular uh, used uh, drawing models in all the schools. And I think Daniel Graves from the Florence Academy of Art was the first teacher to use those in his in his school. Um, and I I've also seen other drawing models from uh, from the nineteenth century, from the seventeenth century. I've seen ones from the from the Renaissance. Um, and have you seen the drawing models made by Bernard Romain Julien, the Julien Drawing Course? 
Uh, I've seen some of them, yeah. So I know the look of them, the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I've, 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 like on, on the internet through my own research, I've heard some artists speaking that perhaps they're a better model to work from than the Bach drawings. And I would you care to comment a, comment on that at all? Yeah. Um, I believe at at the time when the uh, the French government was looking to um, support, I suppose, a particular drawing course that could become used throughout. France. Yeah. Um, there was there were a number of courses available, or say on the market. Mm -hmm. um, there were, and Julian had this particular course, or he had was in the process of making the drawings for it. Yeah. And I think it came down to a choice between either the Bargs or the Julian as to which way to go. Mm -hmm. And um, it was. Looked on, I think the bugs were looked on as being preferable as educational resources or aids mm -hmm. because they were a little simpler. The, the Julian drawings are very beautiful, but they're actually quite complicated yeah. because they, they, they conflate tonal drawing with contour drawing. Yeah. They put, and that's, that's a complicated thing to do, whereas the bugs mm -hmm. tend to set the contour drawing aside and they say, let's just deal with tone. Yeah. So simpler, slightly more fundamental kind of way. And I, I think that his drawings and that approach was chosen for that reason. Mm -hmm. it, it left a level of complication out. Mm -hmm. It's not to say it's bad or anything like that. The Julians are gorgeous things. They are. Um, just more complicated. It adds this added layer that has to be dealt with simultaneously. Yeah. So your contour and your toning or rendering tone at the same time, yeah. and the bugs don't do that. It's it's a separate way. I, I personally prefer it as well. It makes a lot of sense to me, yeah. especially with new students. You know, try and keep it simple. There's of lots of anyway. You know, mm -hmm. just let's get this. Done. And I think also that the bugs do tend to have probably a better logical connection to painting than the Julians do. Yeah. Because of the gorgeous mark making, almost an engraving kind of quality, mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to transcribe into paint. Yeah, that there's not that immediate sympathy. Yeah. Whereas with marks, where it's just tonal rendering, there's a bit of line work in it, but it's not an important aspect. Yeah. Um, there is this kind of sympathy with painting, you know, where it's areas of tone, mm -hmm. where it becomes areas of color. Yeah. So I think that that. Was going on, and I do prefer the bugs, yeah. Sure, and in, in the um, actual uh, book, the Charles Bug drawing course, there's a uh, one particular page which has a uh, I think it's a bust of Homer that's uh, yeah. was created by Julian, and then on the opposite page is a, the bust of Homer that was created by Barg. And you can see that the, the Barg one has so much more form, it's so much more uh, form revealing, and I think, like you're saying, because they were basically built up just through hatching and cross hatching. Whereas I think the um, Julianne plates uh, were, were basically he, he was uh, using the stump to copy or the students were instructed to use the stump when copying those uh, oh, yeah. copying those drawings. Um, and uh, what, what I wanted to ask you as well, in your school, do your students copy the bar drawings 18 by 24 in charcoal or in pencil? Um, what I do is begin all, all of uh, the introduction to classical drawing, which is the bar course for me, is all done in pencil. Yeah, good, yeah. Um, and what I also do is that I have, uh, I, for my students, I need to make nine of them. And I've basically taken apart what I can see as the arrangement, and they only work from the bar drawings that are to do with classical sculpture. Yeah. Um, and so I've taken those apart and divided them into simple and complex. Mm -hmm. And I get students to do nine drawings overall. Mm -hmm. so they need to make three drawings from the simple group, they yeah. make three drawings from the more complex group. Now those drawings are at about A3 size. Mm -hmm. Within that I also ask them to do two drawings that are site size, mm -hmm. sorry, four drawings that are site size and two drawings that are comparative. Yeah. And then the last three drawings they make as being approximate to the size of the plates, about 18 by 24. Great. So they're still in pencil, and they make, again, two site size and one comparative, and that deals with the nine drawings, yeah, but it's all done in pencil. Great. So when they get up to uh, cast paint, uh, cast drawing, are they using charcoal or pencil? 
No, not yet. I keep it. Everything is systematic, so it's all cast drawing in pencil. In pencil. Okay. Did I? And this is to you. Big so, one. So, did I ever? Um, did I ever copy the cast at, at one point in charcoal? Uh, they do, but I reserve it for the second level mm -hmm. when I introduce painting. Yeah. Because I think that there is a better sympathy between charcoal and painting. Of course, yeah. Than between graphite pencil and paintings. Mm -hmm. But the graphite pencil gets them into an area of precision mm -hmm. about what they're seeing and thinking, slows them right down, takes mm -hmm. them ages to do this, so it gets them into that world of... If I'm going to make these things, I've got to I've got to learn patience. I've got to be patient. Yes. So that slowing down process is really important. Yeah. And so do all of that with graphite, and we'll also do life drawing in graphite as well. And then there are some master copies and two anatomy units, and that's the first level. And then in the second level, we go into cast drawing again, but using charcoal, and then we're into cast painting. And so there's that kind of connection between the two. Fantastic. Great. Um, so from what I understand, in the 19th century, the bar drawings were supposed to be copied using charcoal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. why is it that so many schools now are copying them using pencil? Um, I don't necessarily know. Yeah. Um, but as I say, for, I, it, it may be the fact that when you're site size drawing, mm -hmm. especially from the life model, mm -hmm. or from casts, if you can't get actually on the same plane mm -hmm. as the reference, then your drawings will end up being a little smaller and they can be a little more cumbersome to deal with in charcoal. Yep. But I'm not sure. I've got a feeling maybe graphite pencil anyway at the time the bugs were being produced was not an overly popular medium. Yeah. I, My understanding actually is that the... Graphite pencil came basically from England. Now, I, I'm happy to be corrected about this, but my understanding is that graphite pencil was, was coming from England mm -hmm. in the area of around Cumbria where they had graphite deposits, and that's where we get Derwent and those kinds of people, yeah. their drawings. When the French Revolution came, the English stopped any shipment of graphite to the French mm -hmm. because it's graphite that was being used for the designing of new elements of warfare, how yeah. to design guns, how to draw architecture, how to make new weapons. It all had to be drawn. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that the, the English did was that they stopped the export of graphite to France. Yeah. And it was Monsieur Conte who was commissioned to invent a new kind of pencil with some new medium in it that would do the same job. Mm -hmm. I don't think France has the same graphite deposits that Britain has. Mm -hmm. So that's where we get the term Conte from. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and he was honoured for coming out with a Conte pencil, which yeah. is a black carbon pencil essentially. And so that's, that's that kind of connection. And so I don't... I think anyway that graphite was not an overly popular medium at the time that the prints were being developed. Yeah, yeah. and um, just going off of that, actually, I know in the Ecole de Beaux Arts, basically before 1863, 1863, the Academy had a um, basically like a, a reformation, um, and prior to that, the the medium that they were using to draw the model and the cast was, I think, it was pencil. Then after 1863, the academicians favoured using the the, the charcoal. So, yeah, from what I understand, that's, that was basically how it worked in the academy. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, it is interesting. Um, okay, well, I've, I'm just looking at my uh, my list here of questions I've, I've written up prior to having the uh, interview with, with you, Rob. Um, and I'm just seeing what haven't I touched on just as yet. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so one, one thing I wanted to get into a little bit um, was a lot of the schools internationally are focusing on the technical development of, of the artist. So it's all about training. It's all about learning the craft of drawing and painting and sculpture. Um, but if we look historically, the technical training of, a, of, a, of an artist was only really half of, of, the, of the deal. The other half was their kind of intellectual and their uh, aesthetic development, how they developed their aesthetic sensibilities. And from what I can see um, online and things like this, a lot of the schools haven't got a program established yet that um, basically addresses the intellectual development of the artist. 
it's basically all technique without any kind of um, thought. How, how, to, how do we penetrate the artworks? When we go to a museum and we're looking at 19th, uh, 18th, 17th century uh, masterpieces, there's this kind of barrier, it seems, between our time and the artist's time. And how do we learn, basically, to penetrate the artwork, to, to see to observe the artwork not through a lens of co contemporary cultural criticism, which, I, which is what I think a lot of the university art schools do when looking at earlier works of art, but looking at the artworks in, uh, in, in relation to the cultural, ethical um, and kind of so social issues that were prevalent at the time the artwork was created. So I know um, in, in America, in Oakland, California, there's a school that's ran, run by Andrew Emerald. Um, it's called the Golden Gate Atelier. And he is basically implemented a uh, a course dealing with art history and um, a little bit of humanities as well to kind of address the, the the intellectual development of an artist. And I wanted to ask: Is that something you you think in the future you would like to do at the Rob Gutteridge School of Classical Realism? Um, I'm not sure. I'm I'm aware of that kind of debate or that 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 issue. Yeah. Um, I, it just depends how the school goes um, from my point of view. Um, it will be a long time yet before I'll, I have students who are looking to apply the skills that I can give them towards yeah. work that is personally and maybe socially meaningful. Yeah. It'll be quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be the case that um, I would cross that bridge with them when it yeah. when it. Mm -hmm. I think it can be done informally. I, the majority of my students actually are sort of probably mature age people or certainly actually people who have already been art students. Mm -hmm. So they, all of them have some knowledge of art history. I, it's, I get a few that don't, but it's, it's rather rare. Yeah. Um, and so I can always build on that. Um, and also the one of the final painting projects that will eventually come up for them is to put all of their skills together, you know, series of works mm -hmm. that will have to design the meaning of themselves. And I think it may be that I can approach it on a more conversational basis, given yeah. that I believe that the majority of my students will have some art history knowledge, mm -hmm. um, rather than uh, setting up uh, another kind of set of courses or whatever. Um, if I also because I'm doing everything on my own, I have to do what I can um, that is actually practical, you know, yeah. that, that that I can actually carry out. And I can't become a, an art history teacher as a separate kind of set of courses at the yeah. same time as I'm doing. All this. But who knows what the future holds? You know, there may be people who are interested in in uh, in taking that on within the school. Um, yeah. Uh, and but it is important, you know. Um, it's certainly important to understand their kind of knowledge and their their context and so on. Yeah. Um, and um, I I think that I I'm certainly not looking at um, any formalisation of, mm. of requirement at this stage. Mm -hmm. We do talk quite a bit about art history within the context of practice. Yeah. So talk about the materials and the world that they came from to some extent and mm -hmm. that conversational mm -hmm. level is sufficient at the moment mm -hmm. again they're not they're not looking to develop work that is um, self instigated sure, yeah. sure. and I, I think as well that I'd read an interesting thing a while ago that, that was in part sort of talking about this and it was a, a comment about perhaps some of the lack of depth we might say that is evident in the conceptual aspect of a lot of contemporary realist work that is being done. Yeah. So the work is enormously skillful, very spectacular, often impressive, but often um, the meaning aspects can be not so engaging. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the person who was responding to that said that it, it may not be an unreasonable situation to find ourselves in when people who are often undertaking these new courses, these, this new form of art training, mm. they're often young themselves mm -hmm. and you can't necessarily expect a, a world of life experience coming from an extremely talented 22 year old or 25 year old yeah. you know, so you we might have to give another 30 years to this mm -hmm. for these young people to become mature adults who are still working but have lived a life mm -hmm. and something to say mm -hmm. you know apart from the, uh, dragons and you know people with 
kind of wings and that sort of stuff. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with it. <laughs> it, it might just take time because we're looking still at the very early phase, I think, of what's going on. Yeah. Not surprising, you know, not surprising that the work might be a little bit shallow sometimes. Yeah. Although tremendously skillful. That's I think right. It's, reasonable state to find ourselves in yeah mm -hmm. yeah that, those are sort of some enough thoughts i guess okay um and i wanted to ask rob as well do you have any um affiliation with the julian ashton art school at all no i don't no no i don't yeah because yeah. i know the principal of that school is uh paul dalprat and i mean i've pretty much every realist that i've um australian realist that i've i've, I've uh, come across has at one point or another had some kind of contact um, with that school and some artists that are now training abroad in Europe um, you know I've seen on their CV that at one point or another they have passed through the school yeah. and um, in regards to its own its curriculum I think that it isn't from what I understand it isn't so structured it is a lot is a lot more open and um, you know it isn't it isn't like the European models that the, that the schools abroad are based on um, yeah, so it, it is, it isn't, and their website as well, I mean, it isn't, so it doesn't give a lot of information on the actual curriculum, I don't know if you've, if you've had a look at it. Look, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, it is a bit, it's a question mark there, I mean, it is Australia's yeah. oldest art school, but in regards to the, the, the actual instruction that's going on, it's hard to know, um, mm. you know, what it's about exactly. Um, and uh Go, I mean, I'm moving around a bit. I want to go. I want to ask your to get your thoughts on basically the New York movement at the moment. In New York, there's a couple of schools or a few schools around there now that are really uh, producing high quality work. Um, and uh, do you speak much with any of those artists in New York? No, I don't. No, I'm I'm so flat out just dealing with what I've got here. That, yeah. Uh, you know, over time, um, I I will become. Uh, hopefully more in contact with them, but again, I'd like to do it the way that I did with the European stint, which is to, to go there and travel again. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a matter of plotting out a few years in the future. I can maybe get away once a year if I'm lucky, yeah. and each time I go, I'll go to a particular place where I can find new schools to interact with and so on. Sure. So yes, I, it's quite limited in terms of my interaction with those people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so basically, for me, like I f I'm looking on Instagram a lot. Instagram has been incredible for connecting um, artists together. You know, the ones that are working abroad and ones in Australia. And um, yeah, just just for, for me personally, I think the, the the quality of work coming from the schools uh, in New York is incredible. Um, and would you care to comment on uh, the quality of work that's being produced by the schools? And um, where do you see? Who do you think is leading? I suppose the 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 the, qu the quality of work. What, what what part of the world is is the best quality of work coming out of right now? Um, I don't know, and and I um, I'm not good at picking sort of winners in that way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that that I did experience when I was overseas was the similarity between places rather than their differences. Mm. Um, both in the, the sort of physical structures and their curriculum and so on, but also in the quality of the, the output as well. Yeah. So, and probably I'm not really sufficiently or well, well kind of connected to be able to, to give an, an overview of something like that. Sure. Um, so I, I probably shouldn't. But, but also, you know, one of the th whenever I kind of do go to look on sites, I seem to find things that are a little specific to each place, mm -hmm. but they're so really good. So if you look at the Anthony Ryder school, yeah. he has a particular way of doing things. Mm -hmm. If you look at Sadie Valeri's school, mm -hmm. she has a particular way of doing things. Quite different, both really good in their own way. Yeah. Andrew school in San Francisco has his own approach and an, an anatomy approach and so on. So, so that was kind of uh, interesting. And because I'm enthusiastic for all of it mm -hmm. and will find the good things in it, sure. I tend to to think this is the best one and this one kind of not so good. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably quite interested in places that do teach anatomy alongside the other kind of work that goes on there. Mm -hmm. And places do tend to seem to, they tend, seem to be a bit more few and far between. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I look on that as being a bit of a marker as to what, what is going on in a school. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if it's got it or if it doesn't have it. Uh, and, mm. and I like the thought of all the schools having it, if they're dealing with a human figure anyway. Yeah. You know, nevertheless, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably too positive in general for the whole business to think, you know, this is really great and this is not so. I, I could go to any one of those schools and I would find really valuable things to learn. Yeah, that's right. People to connect with and find their own little bias with things and think it's really great, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was that's kind of the way that I experienced the, the variety of things going on. Mm -hmm. And it's true, once you've been looking at this work for long enough, you can start to discriminate between work that's coming from the schools in Italy, the schools in New York, um, you know, the schools in France. Uh, there is a little, there's, the, each instructor has a way of uh, taking their own, I guess, spin on, on the yeah. principles that they're trying to cover, which, um, which is really interesting as well. Um, in, gen in general, do you think that where in a, in, a, in a contemporary atelier movement, are we reaching a level that technical, technically speaking, that's um, you know uh, nearly basically uh, restoring the kind of level, the standard that was evident in the nineteenth and prior centuries? Um, it seems to be mm. um, certainly from the point of view of the technical execution of the work. Um, yeah. There are some stunningly good things going on um, and um, it may be that um, the other aspect that you were alluding to earlier to do with the the meaning of the work mm. might be something that would um, that would cause us to look at our work compared to prior times mm -hmm. as something to contrast you know yeah um, because there I mean I suppose that's why a lot of that historical work that we relate to has an iconic status because they were that those artists did produce things that were phenomenal um, mm -hmm. standing in their impact. Mm -hmm. um, I don't yeah. think it's just through exposure through the media or because you know we're familiar with them. Yeah, I really do think that that somehow they were able to produce some images. Um, that have stood the test of time and remain in in one's memory. You just bring them to light. Yeah. And it's you know it's probably a bit difficult for us to kind of know um, the true situation that they were dealing with historically when so much of the work that was going on at that time has been lost. Yeah. Um, you know, to what extent were these kind of standout objects in in the thousands of paintings and drawings that, that were being made at, at that time, you know, yeah. difficult to know what that's like. Mm -hmm. mm. I think from a technical point of view, you know, surely that uh, we're doing things as well as has been done before, you know, well, I think so. You think so, yeah. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I mean, I guess from my own perspective, I see a lot of um, work that's technically really good, but I, I see, like, still lives, I see, I see figure paintings, a bit of landscape, but one thing that I think is missing is the, the kind of, um, the, the, the highest subject level, which was the, 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 the history paintings. I think that's one thing that we're kind of missing in the yeah. contemporary atelier movement is uh, multi-figure narrative paintings, and that's yeah. a harder subject, of course, yeah. and I think there's not a lot um, being produced. I mean, I've seen people like um, you know, uh, Carl Dobsky, are you familiar with? Yeah, he's got the Safe, Hel Safe House Atelier in San Francisco as well. He does some, you know, some multi-figure narrative work, uh, Max Ginsberg and, and people like this. But, yeah, it's, um, I think, something that's still, we need a bit of work, I guess, in yeah, that. That's a good point, actually, yeah. The, um, that, that aspect of seeing um, many, many paintings, as you say, of still life or portraits um, done, um incredibly well or in a rush of uh, exhilaration and so on, um, it's, it's got to have its limit. Um, you know, we can't keep looking at those things forever. And, and that's, again, one of the good things about looking out all the time is to say, well, it's hard enough to get to a level where one can do that well, competently, yeah. but it, it sh that should lead one to other areas of exploration. That should be a basis on to find out more. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is, is is quite true. Actually, it's a very difficult thing to get find your way into, you know, multiple figure compositions and so on, and and for all sorts of often very practical reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I'm really all for things that where photography is is not 
used. Um, I've worked from photographs and, and so on, but I would like to think that the areas that I'm heading into and what I'm teaching my students would be non-photographically based. I know that the Russians have on their of their stuff that if you are applying to go to a summer school there or their students, absolutely no photographs. They yeah. will not even use anything That's done right. That's right. So and and I think you know so some of those practical things do come into it. You know, how do you afford the models, for example? Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's expensive. Of course. Like, you know, I pay my models um, thirty dollars an hour. Yeah. And I contact with um, a student who's completing her studies in Florence Academy, mm -hmm. and their model costs are nine euros an hour, which is about thirteen dollars. Yeah. Now, it's so it's three times the amount here. Mm -hmm. and so how do you employ people for extended periods of time? Um, you know, yeah, they are well supported here anyway. You know, so there's a, a big financial constraint on that, and I actually still haven't got my head around that. Um, yeah, it's something that I'm thinking about for the future. I'll continue the figurative work I'm doing, but I don't know how I'm going to solve it. You know? Sure. So, um, Rob, in your school, are you using uh, comparative measurement or site size? I know you briefly commented on this. Uh, previously, so you use site size uh, to do some of the bar drawings, is that right? And then you bring in comparative measurement for the figure? Yep, yeah. yeah. So I do want my students to be familiar with both approaches, they need to know it. Yeah. Um, but currently, um, the work is biased towards about two thirds site size, and a third of the work they do is comparative. Mm -hmm. It will go on for some time. Um, certainly into second level, and it may be in third level that I'll begin to introduce the idea of the development of a personal aesthetic, mm -hmm. when they can be to choose what kind of methods they would prefer to work with. Mm -hmm. But the same size, it, it does remain very helpful when you're trying to, well, teach people to be sensitive to what they're seeing, mm -hmm. to produce a situation where there is success and accomplishment in what they're doing, which mm -hmm. gives them confidence to continue. And also it puts everybody on a similar level, so you're actually critiquing the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult in open situations, especially with people who are not so well schooled, mm. to try to teach things like life drawing or life painting when they can be coming at it from all over the place. There's no common ground around which you can discuss or compare. Yeah. So it's, it's very valuable from that point of view. But I think the limitations and benefits of both have to be spelled out, mm -hmm. and I think Great for people to be able to choose. So you've got to teach them both. I think. Mm -hmm. From my, that's so true. Like I think so many, um, like with live drawing today, so many of the the artists that have come out of the university art school system um, employ the kind of warts and all approach, where they're you know they're just drawing basically based on ignorance. It's not based on a kind of um, you know classical idealism, where you know you're basically representing the figure as a as a Greco Roman statue, but um, perhaps drawing every little detail uh on the figure which um yeah isn't really what i guess the classical aesthetic is is really about um and the uh, the size size is, is true what you're saying about the size size. i think it's such a great uh tool to use to help develop the student's eye and to have that one-to-one -one comparison to establish a kind of vantage point that the teacher and student can look at and agree on rather than just things being kind of hit or miss um, and then later, as the eye develops, the teacher can start to fade um, the, 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 the reliance on the site size method and start to introduce, you know, comparative measurement once the eye develops um, a little bit more. Um, and it's just great to have the, the, the idea of the, the more experienced eye, to have the teacher behind you um, who can actually see, you know, if this is off or that shape is, 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 is too big or too small um, and relate it to something rather than just being... Uh, you know, based on 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 whim, I guess, or or, or just a random, like an arbitrary kind of uh, decision. So yeah, now I, I like I like what you're saying about the site size as well. I agree with that. Um, and just going back to the um, situation with the plaster casts, I understand um, at the turn of the century, a lot of the plaster casts were destroyed or sent to storage in a lot of um, lot of lot of museums and a lot of um, art schools. And that's why I think today it's so hard to get quality plaster casts. I mean, I see a lot of plaster casts in art stores that have, have mold lines on them and just aren't very well made. Um, and you get your plaster casts from the Gus Gallery, is that right? Yes. Yeah. 
the Juiced Gallery. Sorry, is, the, is every, the Juiced Gallery, yeah. That's the pronunciation. I had to check with them, so I couldn't figure <laughs> it. But it's the Juiced Gallery, yeah. The yeah. Juiced Gallery, yeah. And I know a lot of schools um, around the world get their cast from there. I actually have a few of their cast oh. myself. Um, oh. And they're just, yeah, the craftsmanship, the way they're made is incredible. I mean, and you, and you really need uh, the quality cast. When you're trying to draw a cast, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a graphite pencil that's been sharpened to a needle point, you need to be observing smooth, you know, flat surfaces without, uh, you know, surface, uh, you know, mold lines on the surface and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's great. It's great that we have, uh, I think, basically, the Juiced Gallery and uh, Felice Calci is another good supplier of casts, and they're in Rome, I think. Um, yeah, they have good 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 casts as well. Um, but, yeah, from what I understand, they're pretty much the two main suppliers of, of quality plaster casts uh, mm. uh, today. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it's great that we have an uh, opportunity to, to still purchase casts that are made by hand. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so I'm just having a look again over my list. And one thing I want to ask you as well, now, so you're the first, your school, the Rob Gutteridge School of Classical Realism, is the first ARC-approved school in Australia. That's fantastic. Um, and I want to know a little bit about the process of applying for and becoming an ARC approved school. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they have a template of questions which you go through, quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, and um, you go through and answer the questions. There is a, um, a period of about three months where after you've submitted your application, it's looked at by members of their board or whoever they are. Mm -hmm. So. Kara Ross, who's um, the, one of the principal organisers of ARC at the moment, yeah. and it may be other Fred Ross as well. But anyway, it, so it's vetted by a number of people mm -hmm. ARC who would be you know, involved in overseeing internationally um, this kind of standards that are involved. Um, there is a fee payment for that to be done, mm -hmm. and then it's an ongoing fee payment for each year you pay an amount to retain your membership, I suppose, and exposure on their website and, and all the rest, which is good. Yeah. And the kind of questions they were asking were the sort that you'd expect really about, um, so I sent them things like, uh, oh, they need to know if you've got a website, so that's an important aspect to them. They want to know uh, your curriculum, or if there is one. Mm -hmm. uh, some places would be teaching this sort of stuff, they wouldn't have a curriculum at all. And it's probably been part of the benefit of my university teaching training mm -hmm. and because I've taught universities all my life. You're very much habitualized to the need to write curricula, write subject matter, write course yeah. matter. Write, you'd know all of that, you've been through it. Yeah. yeah. So a very formal kind of aspect is probably not necessarily something that everyone might come at this with. You know, mm -hmm. you've not the art skills, you've got to be able to teach, you've got to be able to organize a place and all the rest of it but you've also got to make it into um a uh, a, a curriculum a teaching something that can be taught something that can be seen to be taught yeah and there have been other applicants they've said from australia who have applied for arc approval but they have not received it so it's not mm. as if it's you know rubber stamping people that come through they're checking them pretty carefully yeah anyway and I write out my all of my stuff pretty thoroughly. Um, so I saw that, that, yeah, on your website. It's great. So that was there. They needed to know, uh, needed to see examples of your own work mm -hmm. and examples of student work. Mm -hmm. um, they need to know things to do with your premises. Yeah. Whereabouts is it? Is it close to an art shop? Is it um, what it's, what's the floor, uh, square metre floorage? What kind of facilities have you got? Have you all of that sort of stuff. So they do go through, through things pretty rigorously. Do you have any other teaching staff? They're going to be part time, full time. What are your costs? Um, how you know what's what's your CV? Um, they need to know all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. One of the things that they did come back to me with was that um, after I'd done all of that and I received word from them that the school had been approved, but. And the but was that I had a personal website that I've had for many years. Mm -hmm. And it it's work that is from my earlier, not abstract period, but semi-figurative period. Mm, yeah. And they were, they didn't want to make it a requirement that I did something about that, but they said, they pointed out that it could be confusing to people yes. if they 
if they're seeing work that is semi-figurative and I'm promoting a school that is classically figurative, full mm-hmm. on figurative, and they asked, could, could something be done about that? And I said, look, I, that's a really great thing to have pointed out. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about it. Um, and I said, I'm very happy to. So what I did was I closed down that website, which is my personal one, yeah. and just use my school uh, my school website and then uploaded all of my realist work. Yes. Onto the, so there's no evidence on the web of Rob Guttridge. Well, that would be historically, but not sort of someone looking for my school. Yeah. Um, that was a confusing situation. So mm-hmm. that's quite yeah. important, actually. And so people who are looking to study somewhere, they're going to be looking for images of this kind of work. Does it look like the kind of thing that I think realism or classical realism might be about or contemporary realism? They've got to see examples of it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so the, the teacher has to be um, a practitioner and, and at that, well, high mm-hmm. level as, as much as one can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm glad that we have uh, resources like the the, the RRC, uh, you know, that that basically promote and keep up to date with all workshops and uh, new 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 newly established schools around the world and things like that. And um, it's so true what you're saying about you know the confusion, like what you were explaining about the modernist, your semi-figurative work and your figurative work. And um, I think that, you know, like Fred Ross is so, reading his writing and things like that, he's so strictly uh, academic, you know, it has to be. I mean, he, he puts Bulgaro like up the top, that's that's his, uh, you know, his, his standard. And, um, but yeah, I'm really great that we have, you know, organizations like that. Uh, and going off of that, uh, Rob, what you were saying about some schools in Australia are pr- applying for ARC approval, do you think we can expect in the future to see more schools being established with ARC approval in Australia? Well, uh, I think so. I mean, I hope so. I, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be, you know, um, and I think it would be really great. It, as you were saying earlier, it would be nice if some kind of community could begin to develop here. Mm. Um, when uh, the, the person I'm in contact with at the Florence Academy said that there are five Australians who are currently studying there. Yeah. Some of those might come back, you know, and they're going to need things to do. And, and you do come back with uh, or you come from these things with an enthusiasm to share, mm-hmm. not not only to practice, to do that, but to share as well mm-hmm. all the knowledge that you end up having, you know, you can pass it on. So I think it's it's inevitable. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I would really welcome it when it does come. Yeah. Sure. Um, and another thing I wanted to, to touch on, Rob, was you're self-taught, your anatomy, you've basically taught yourself anatomy and I'm so glad that the Rob Goddard School of Classical Realism has an Ecorche uh, program. Um, and so how did you basically go about developing your anatomy, uh, your anatomy subject? Yeah, um, just just in prefacing that, um, what you said is, is true that I am self-taught in, in these kinds of schools and, and it's I've had to be and, and I have been reassured by that. You know, it has been when I was thinking about beginning a school, it was a bit of a concern that, well, I hadn't studied at Florence Academy or wherever. Yeah. I studied number of schools around the world, mm-hmm. but I hadn't studied there for those reasons. And I, in reading I was doing, I came across a number of directors of older schools, atelier schools, mm. same position as me, and they were saying, I'm self-taught as well, and I had to be. There was no choice. There was nowhere to go. That's so right. It, slow slog hmm. of teaching yourself and you can get there but it takes a long time and that's part of the benefit of these newer schools it's an accelerated learning program that you're going to go through yeah um so i feel reassured to find there are other people out there saying look if you're of my generation i'm mm-hmm. early 60s if you're of my generation studied in the 70s there's no way you're going to have come out knowing being taught these kinds of things and if you can teach them the only way you'd have got there over these periods of decades would have been to have become self-taught. So I am not alone in that, which makes me feel good. Yeah. As far as the anatomy goes, um, I reached a point where I knew that I could do everything that was required of me to paint and draw accurately from observation. Mm-hmm. Now, it's all of the visual things I could understand, I could reproduce, I understood how light falls on objects. It, it just all of that perceptual stuff I didn't know. But because of my interest in the human figure, I also knew that I, I didn't know anatomy. Yeah. Never been it. And I thought 
it, it just felt um, slightly inauthentic, I'd have to say. Mm -hmm. It felt like I was only able to ever get at the skin. Yeah. There was no sense of this kind of underlying structure, the architecture. I mm -hmm. just didn't. Sure. And I also knew historically that artists that I admired did have it. Yeah. And I'd always aspired to be as good as those. So Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, all of these kinds of people are my mm -hmm. early heroes. And I knew that they knew anatomy. And I wondered always, is that affecting what they did? It yeah. was something that I can't get to um, because I don't have this knowledge. So anyway, from that, I thought, I thought, well, you, if you're really that interested, you've just got to do it yourself. You've got to. Mm -hmm. so what I did was I loaned two skeletons from one of the art schools. Mm -hmm. And my mother-in-law has a small shed, which is 2.5 metres by 1.5 metres. Yeah. It's, it's a box in her backyard. <laughs> um, and uh, so I put the skeletons in there, got a little room set up, uh, or a table set up where I could work, um, bought a, a bunch of anatomy books, some artistic, some medical. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a book, Bruno Licasi, who was an early example, a clay sculptor, okay. who has a book on uh, anatomy sculpture. Mm -hmm. And an écorché. Um, it's not overly rigorous, but quite good. Do you remember the uh, title, Rob? Uh, I think it might, it might be something as simple as figure sculpture or figure sculpting for the artist or something like that. Okay. Bruno Lucchesi, it's L-U-C-C-H-E-S-I, something like that. But he won't be hard to find. I'll look into it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I had that book as a guide. Um, it doesn't give you much, but it, it was a help. Uh, at least it showed me, again, a model. Look, somebody's doing it. It's been done. You can do it. Yeah. It's, it can happen. I knew that it had been done historically. And I knew that it was a, a learning and a teaching method. Um, and also I tried to teach myself as much anatomy as I could through drawing and found mm -hmm. that it was rather limited. And I'm not a trained sculptor, yeah. um, but I knew that a three-dimensional experience of these forms that I was trying to understand and these relationships, it's all spatial. Mm -hmm. It's all volumetric. It's all about beginnings and ends. Where does a form begin and end and so on? I thought, the, look, the best way to do this is through sculpture. Yeah. So I then had to find out, well, how do I make a sculpture of a figure that's going to stand up? Mm. And so, so yeah. it, was a, it was very arduous. Um, but the first one that I made was an 80-centimetre high figure. So I took a skeleton as being uh, 1.6 centimetres, which is the standard kind of plastic skeleton that I was yeah. going to see. But if I divide that in half, then every measurement I take from the figure, I can divide in two, and it'll be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. In other words, half a femur, half a head size, all of that, just half it all. Mm -hmm. So that that allowed me to get into it. And I actually wasn't going to teach it at first. I just did it because I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. and that was it. And so, but as I was going through it, fairly on, I was finding this is so interesting. There's, there's going to be other people who are interested in this. There's got to be. It can't just be me. So I thought I'll, I'll turn it into a course. So I then began every step that I went through, every measurement that I took, I wrote it all down. Mm -hmm. And actually I sequenced it. I said this is what I went through. Made it all written out as if one could do it, as it was in my case, without a teacher. Mm -hmm. In other words, make it everything blatantly obvious. This is what you do next and so on. Yeah. Um, and it took – that whole process took three years. So wow. that was awesome. Yeah, about 3,000 hours. I do about 1,000 hours a year. Incredible. And, uh, and so, well, I think it may also show I'm not a fast learner, but I'm <laughs> stubborn. <laughs> but at the end of it, it was a really fulfilling experience, you know, to, to yeah. have done this. And I, I did feel, again, authentically that I, I now know the figure. Mm. I can do things with it. I, I'm, not, I'm not having self-doubts yeah. about, you know, uh, about it and so it, it does empower you feel yeah I can do this, this with some authority now when I draw and when I paint I'm, I'm basically I've got as much knowledge as these guys had that, that began doing it so yeah that and that's um, that's incredible because it's so true like a, a lot of uh, drafts people or painters might 
think of Echo Ache as maybe something that's more uh, for sculptors, but you know, understanding the anatomy of the body is detrimental to actually being able to represent the body, especially from imagination and from various perspectives. Um, so yeah, Corchet is, is critical. Um, so you, you're, saying, you're saying that you had a bit of contact with Andrew Emerald about his anatomy program? Because from what I understand, he developed the anatomy program for the Florence Academy of Art. Yeah, um, I did mention it to him um, in, through email, but didn't get much response back that was helpful. Yeah. But probably the person I had the most helpful uh, sort of contact with was um, a guy called Andrew Corse, mm. who was a played guy actually who works for anatomytools.com mm. and makes a lot of he makes all of their educational models sure. and the models that I use and, and they're fantastic. So I sent him examples of my Ecorche um, and asked him to critique it basically and he said look it was all really good, really fine and so on. Great. His it's very expensive. I couldn't buy them at the time. But mm. it was again it's just nice to know that there are people out there because otherwise you feel very alone. You feel a bit That's right. Oh, not just often a tangent, but there are people out there who are doing this sort of stuff um, and being validated by it. They fit into a context, whereas I, I certainly wasn't fitting into one, but I had a hunch that I was doing the right thing. Mm. So probably Andrew Course was more beneficial than Andrew Emerald, but sure. having seen this um, approach to things, um, it's very similar to what I did, but it's also interesting that the person I was mentioning earlier about who I've had some contact with at the Florence Academy, the Adelaide woman, um, yeah. she was here a month or so ago and we were going through what I do with the Corsier because, she, as she put it, she's an anatomy nerd. <laughs> so she's studying anatomy at the Florence Academy. Yeah. Um, and when I showed her the resource, the book that I developed and told her about how I go about it and <laughs> what I provide to my students, sure. um, she was very impressed. <laughs> she said she wished she had what I was providing for my students. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily want to say that in any way disparaging in relation to what goes on at Florence because all the results are always good. Yeah. Um, again, it's just nice to know that what you do really in a vacuum, mm -hmm. like that I produce, the, what I, the research I put into it, what I came out of it with and how I now teach it, that, that you've got someone who's exposed to all that stuff going on on a regular basis who looks at it and says, oh, this is really good. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is really good. Sure. So it again, validates your efforts. Validation, yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, just, you, you're clueless. You don't know, being in Australia, where you, how, how do you relate? How do you yeah. compare? It, 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 yeah. Yeah from time to time and see what's going on. It's it's frustrating when the way that you kind of commune with this uh, movement is just through the internet. There's oftentimes yeah. not, you know, people around you that are doing this kind of work. So it can feel very isolating. I completely understand what you're saying there. Um, so just to go back for a second, uh, uh, Rob, you were saying that you got your skeleton, your basic your models, your skeletal models from anatomytools.com. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, because I was... Uh, no, the no the um, the contact that I had for um, some feedback was anatomytools.com. Oh, okay. I knew they were making uh, ecorche type models. Mm. I used skeletons that I borrowed from one of the art schools here in Adelaide. I knew some of the oh. people there. They had spare, and yeah. I explained what I was doing, and they said, "Yeah, have them for a, they have longer tanks." Mm. Yeah. So the reason so I, I, so I just looked full size skeletons in my tiny studio. Yeah, great. Because the reason I ask is because I was actually looking for some skeletons myself, but um, I was looking online and the, the quality of some of them are, uh, you know, not very great. So I was just wondering, maybe you knew of certain suppliers that are making quality ones. Um, but yeah, they are hard to get a, a hold of, from what I from what I understand. <clears throat> well, the the natural skeletons are basically impossible to get. Yeah. Um, and so you have to go to the the plastic ones and. The ones that are most commonly used and the one that I have, um, I obtained from Mentone, uh, uh, Mentone or Medical Products or something like that they'll be. They're in Melbourne, actually. Okay. M-E-N-T-O-N-E. -E. Mm -hmm. um, and they provide educational aids for hospitals and schools and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And the one that I got is a full-size skeleton. It's white plastic. Um, and I, I can't give you the exact kind of definition of it, but the price is a guide. It's about about four hundred and fifty dollars or yeah. 
five. It's sort of in that area. Yeah. Not super expensive. Mm -hmm. They can be a couple of grand. Yes. So there are some nasty ones that are less than that that are quite inexpensive. Mm -hmm. This is a full size one, um, and it's generally pretty good. Yeah, yeah. certainly used in other art stores. Yeah. yeah, and a good price actually. Very. Uh, I thought, yeah, you know, for 450 or thereabouts, uh, this was money well spent. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, great. That sounds great, Rob. Um, so another thing I want to ask, Rob, is the work that's being created by your school. Are you um, using the term that was coined by Richard Lack, classical realism, to describe the work, or have you just gone off off of uh, contemporary realism? No, I use classical realism. Classical and realism. I do, yeah, I do acknowledge that in the general information that I give about my school on my website. Yeah, that's like right. Where that's, that term has come from. Yeah. Um, so I, I acknowledge him for, for kind of generating that. And because uh, I do get asked, well, you know, what, is, what does that actually mean? What, do, what is it? I say, well, it's got this, it comes from a particular guy in Minneapolis who, who coined the phrase. Um, mm. But for me, it suits my school because it, it does fit together really nicely with two different approaches in one one sort of term or one phrase, one idea, mm. and that is that a classical approach, it, it not only has useful traditional or historical associations, so it says that you're in some kind of historical context, mm -hmm. but also a classical approach has something of a, a generalizing idea approach to sure. what that one is looking at. Yeah. Um, and it comes through in the kind of sculpture that we associate with classicism, um, the kind of cast that we use and the kind of paintings that we deal with as well. And, and in a way, that was why realism in the 19th century was rather shocking because mm. suddenly the people who were not classically proportioned and formed and is this legit and all of that sort of stuff. So classical puts you in that area of, of an idealization. Yeah. Um, but the realism actually puts you in touch with an idea of reality right here and right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that the classicism refers, at least for me, to conceptual idea or a conceptual approach to understanding and seeing. Yeah. And the realist idea is much more of a perceptual approach. Yeah. It is, what is it that I'm seeing right now? Mm -hmm. Those two things can synthesize, they can fuse together. And it, it's actually, from a, another point of view, and, and consequently, the, the results can, might not be either one thing or the other. Yeah. But, one, but perception is informed by our knowledge and our history and our situation. Mm -hmm. we, can't, we don't see like cameras. We see with all of who we are. Yeah. And that includes our education and everything else. And so the reality that we're perceiving that we might be trying to deal with is actually informed and changed by our knowledge and experience yeah. and our some history and so on. Mm -hmm. And also from, um, uh, the, from the point of view of neuroscience as well, I'm, I'm quite interested in how the brain actually deals with vision. Yeah. Uh, there, there is still a, an undetermined relationship between what's called top-down processing, visual processing, and bottom-up visual processing. Mm -hmm. What it means is that the bottom-up idea happens in the occipital area, the back of the head, mm -hmm. and that's the key raw data that is being brought into the brain through the eyes and assembled in some way. Mm -hmm. So it'll get sorted into edges that are tilting, edges that are curved, edges that are vertical, horizontal, things that are round, things that are square, and so on. Mm -hmm. And it builds complexity. But there is a point at which they don't know what happens beyond that basic digital, uh, sorry, basic data processing event. In other words, there, there are these seven stages within this occipital area where visual information data is organized in some way. And it becomes mm -hmm. increasingly complex. But there's also this top-down idea that we also have in our brains, in our minds, concepts. Mm -hmm. So the table is. I know what a table is, and there I'm seeing a table. Well, you're actually seeing two things. So you're seeing the concept of a table and you're seeing all of the raw data that's from that table that's flooding your brain. Yeah. And somehow these two things are being synthesized to give us the experience of that particular three-dimensional table. Mm. But there is a concept about it. Yeah. And 
this raw data, you know, and, and it's almost, for me, it's like classicism and realism. Like the classical is like the conceptual stuff. It's the generalized, rounded forms. It's the, you know, proportionate anatomy. It's all of the normative aspects of the human figure that we know about. Mm-hmm. And the realist aspect is that when well, this person doesn't quite look like that, mm-hmm. but I'm looking for it. I'm looking for what's normative, what's general, what's in common, what's true. Yeah. I, I can't recognize a human being. I'll see bits of data, mm-hmm. which I'll interpret. Yeah. So a long explanation, but I like classical realism as a term that comes together that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really- I'm sure you've read um, the actual article that Richard Lack wrote about classical realism where he actually defines what the, the, the term is and what embodies the term, what principles the, the actual movement uh, is, is based on. And so many um, artists from this movement agree that the term itself is an oxymoron, like it's almost a contradiction because classical and realist, like you were explaining, were opposed in the 19th century. Um, yeah, so it's a, bit, it's a bit tricky like that. But I, I think... Um, some artists that I've been speaking to uh, through the e- through emails and such have explained that the term now classical realism is a far cry from what Richard Lack intended it to be in the, at the time that he conceived of the actual uh, idea. And um, I think what this particular artist I was speaking to was alluding to was that things now are taken to a point where they're so real, where where people are rendering. Um, you know, uh, 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 forms and, 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 and portraits and such to be more than just, you know, cl- more, more than classical realism, almost verging on like hyper realism, if you will. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess what, yeah, what I'm trying to get at is perhaps we've moved away from the term classical realism into something, into something else. Um, and and another thing I want to touch on that this particular artist was mentioning was the idea of the the atelier was that it's one instructor and a small group of students um, that are studying in a very intimate, very structured um, uh, setting. Whereas now a lot of schools that have developed in, in in Europe and the United States are calling themselves ateliers, where in fact they're more along the lines of an academy because it's not just one instructor who's teaching the students it's a, a lot of instructors that are teaching the students yeah so I guess it's more uh, more in line with a with a uh, an academy than an atelier um, and that was just another thing that I guess I wanted to to point out with with the movement that's perhaps isn't um, as true as it was in the 19th century um, and uh, yeah because the, basically the the embryo of it began with uh, Ives Gamble passing on his knowledge to, to Richard Lack through and through the Fenway Studios in Boston, which was where Lack and so many people that had read Twilight of Painting, which was Gamble's um, book. Have you read that, by the way, Rob? No, I want to, yeah. yeah. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah. yeah uh, but once he published that book, I believe in the 1940s, so many people, like you, you mentioned before, like artists from the older generation didn't have the kind of... Um, uh, schools available to them like we do have now. So, so many artists that read through a lot of painting in the 1940s actually showed up, from what I've read, to, to Gamel's doorstep asking him, you know, <laughs> will you train me, basically? And, um, and yeah, and Fenway's studios in Boston is like a, a historical art studio complex. And, yeah, and that's where he basically taught from and passed on all his knowledge. And um, it's interesting that so, so many people have been students of lack, but, uh, you know, the students of Gamble as well is uh, who's been a student of Gamble and Richard Lack is Charles Cecil in 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 uh, the city who has the Cecil Studios in the Florence in, in Florence as well, um, and I just find that interesting as well that he's got kind of both ends, so he's yeah. perhaps even closer to the tradition than some of the other schools uh, in yeah. Florence, but at the same time his school doesn't get as much attention as yeah. you know the, the the Angel Academy and the Florence Academy. And um, I mean, they're all over social media. Those schools, you, you see all the work being created. But it's uh, it's fascinating what's what's going on. And I'm very fond of the movement and where it leads to uh, in the future. And uh, you know, I see it as my if this is what one way I can contribute for my for my own teaching in the secondary uh, visual art uh, sphere um, by passing on you know technical training to younger students and to to help them see the value of um, you know fine draftsmanship. Um, I think that's a good thing. And are you familiar? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Are you familiar with the Da Vinci Initiative? Yes, yes, yeah. I am. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's really what I um that kind of model is actually something I want to try and introduce here in 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 Melbourne, and I've um I've had a bit of contact through email through with Mandy Hellenius. She's the co-founder along with Julia Aristides of the Da Vinci Initiative, and basically asking her if she would like to hold some of her workshops here in Melbourne for professional development for teachers, for art teachers, secondary art teachers, and um, we're basically we're trying to work on funding at the moment. If we can get funding to get uh, herself over here with some of the s teachers from the schools in America over here to hold workshops in, um, you know, in a, s a certain uh, facility here in Melbourne um, to basically train teachers in, in, and to help them understand what this atelier training is. Yeah. Mm. So... Um, Power to you, Emilio. That sounds like a fantastic thing to to be involved in. Yeah, good thanks, honor. Rob. Thank you, um, and I really appreciate uh, you ha taking the time to just sit down with me and talk about this. And um, I'll, just as a kind of conclusion, I suppose I wanted to mention as well. I recently received your email about the Rob Guttery School of Classical Realism Summer School, um, and is that a new uh, sort of conception that you've come up with? Just just introducing it this year or for next year? Using it this year, yeah. Last time uh, at, uh, in January this year, so the last time we were in a summer school, kind of, it, I did an Ecorche one, which was well received. Yeah. But um, there are, you, you just have so many ideas of, of kind of ways that one can promote things and new things that one can do and, and expose people to. Um, that uh, this, uh, I thought I will try this this time, um, and it's really a, a way to uh, again sort of deal with people's lack of knowledge about what goes on within an atelier yeah. and try and provide at least a, a, a sense of this is what the training is about. This yeah. is, these are the kinds of general things you'd be dealing with. So especially the cast and figurative drawing, I won't do the bark drawing, but I'll teach sight mm. size and so on. Um, and so it's to, to try and give people in a short time a, quite a broad view of, of, of what's taught and how, and how it's taught. Yeah. And it, it may turn out that it will result in a few more students, which I could always do with. Um, but also it's a way of people uh, who are curious about these things being able to, to experience it without necessarily having to make a full commitment or for a long period of time. Yeah. But they can find out, you know. Yeah. And again, the more people come, then the more people will talk, and so hopefully the thing will just gradually spread. Yeah. Fantastic. That's that's great, Robin. I commend you on that as well. Um that's yeah, yeah, really, really inspiring. And um, uh, are you attending the new figurative art convention and expo that's happening in November? Uh, no. <laughs> no, yeah. no um, either, either am I, but I just thought I'd ask because it's something that was introduced and something I'm very excited by as well, um, especially because there's going to be so many artists in that particular area yeah. at the same time. Where are they holding that again? It's in, uh, it's in, it's in Miami. It's in a hotel, the Biltmore Hotel in Miami, and they've got yeah. an incredible lineup of artists who are going to be giving demonstrations. Yeah, yeah. so it's uh, really some, and it's going to keep going. Apparently, they're going to move it around the world uh, as as you know as time goes by. So that's really um that's that's great to see. Um, yeah. so any anything else you want to say, Rob, before we finish up? No, uh, apart from just, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak about these things. It's really great, Emilio, kind of meeting you in this way and finding people with a similar enthusiasm for this business. Um, and it's always a pleasure to kind of be, uh, you know, talking through the ideas that we're, we're obviously both involved in. Um, and so that's that's been great. And I, it's really good that, you know, you're also, I suppose, in a position where you can have some influence you know if you're there as a teacher with students and you've got this energy to generate something new like uh, getting people over from os and uh, looking at the da vinci initiative possibilities of you know expanding this uh, business then you're you're well placed to to be able to uh, do something and i just hope that it does go really really well for you and probably uh, as well, I assume then that you must also be painting and drawing yourself, or do, or something, or. Um, well, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I've come to learn that this my pursuit through teaching and my painting and drawing is kind of like the same, the same mm -hmm. sort of thing. Because one thing I I didn't want to do was become a teacher, you know, just to to earn a living. I wanted to um, become a teacher 
as a way of, uh, I mean, I've, I've heard, I'm sure you're familiar with Jacob Collins. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, was, I was listening to an interview with him once, and he was saying that his, his this is where I got the idea from, that his work, his, his painting, his work, and his teaching, his efforts to culminate a community of artists, which is kind of manifested into the Grand Central Atelier in New York, uh, was the same. This idea of uh, a life's work, if you will, so he has, he, you yeah. know, he's, he's basically got his painting, but what he's contributing to teaching is just um, explaining what he's doing through his art and trying to, you know, I guess lift that, rise that tide, like I was talking about that analogy of lifting that tide. And so, yeah, I think of it as a life's work. If that Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's yeah. Very, yeah it's great. Great attitude to have. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very Good much, Rob. Yeah. Um, so... What I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll email you a copy of this uh, recorded interview. And one thing I want to do as well, I'm going to send you a copy of my master's thesis, which was on school-based training in aesthetics in visual art education. I think that's a good yeah. resource for you to, to uh, have a look at and just read over. Because I do um, talk quite in depth about the movement at the moment and the curriculum right. in schools. Yeah. So feel free to have a read over that and any feedback you feel like dropping off in, you know, through an email, do that. And I hope to keep this dialogue open with you and, um, you know, to, to, to keep in touch and to see what you're up to. And, um, and is there a website at all that listeners can find uh, your um, books or that? Just go to www.rgcr.com.au and that will get you to my school website and that will be a start. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm always contactable on email, Rob J. Guttridge, G-U-T-T-E-R-I-D-G-E at gmail.com. Yeah. So I'm always happy to receive emails from people. Sure. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that um, my students will be interested in the work that you've done as well in terms of the uh, master's thesis. And mm. yeah, a copy in my little library would be very, very welcome. Oh, yeah. sure. Oh, great. I'll, I'll send it through to you, Rob. And I should—I suppose I should state my own email address for listeners. It's Emilio, E-M-I-L-I-O, dash 89 at hotmail.com. Uh, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, you can to discuss what we've been talking about in this interview further. But uh, once again, Rob, thank you very much for taking this opportunity to, to, to talk with me today. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll speak with you again, hopefully in the not too distant future. Mm. That would be great. Thank you, Amelia. It's been lovely meeting you. Great right. pleasure. You too, Rob. All the best. All the best. Yeah. Take care and best of luck with your school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.